Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Will you please rise for our national anthem? This evening's anthem will be performed by Julia Priestman from Central Columbia. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting Our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star spangled then I yet wave or the land of the of the 90th Pennsylvania FFA State Convention and Activities Week. Mr. Vice President, are all officers at their stations? I shall call the roll of officers, determine if they are at their stations, and report back to you, Madam President. The Sentinel. Stationed by the door. Your duties there. Through this door pass many friends of the FFA. It is my duty to see that the door is open to our friends at all times and that they are welcome. 
I care for the meeting room and paraphernalia. I strive to assist the president in maintaining order. The reporter. The reporter is stationed by the flag. Why by the flag? As the flag covers the United States of America, so I strive to inform the people in order that every man, woman, and child may know that the FFA is a national organization that reaches from the state of Alaska to the Virgin Islands and from the state of Maine to Hawaii. The treasurer. Stationed at the emblem of Washington. Your duties there. I keep a record of receipts and disbursements just as Washington kept his farm accounts carefully and accurately. I encourage thrift among the members and strive to build up our financial standings through savings and investments. George Washington was better able to serve his country because he was financially independent. The secretary. Stationed by the ear of corn. Your duties there. I keep an accurate record of all meetings and correspond with other secretaries wherever corn is grown and FFA members meet. The chaplain. The chaplain is stationed by the Book of Life. Your duties there. The symbol of my office is the Book of Life. It is my duty to offer spiritual guidance to those who seek direction. The advisor. Here, by the owl. Why stationed by the owl? The owl is a time-honored emblem of knowledge and wisdom. Being older than the rest of you, I'm asked to advise you from time to time as the need arises. I hope that my advice will always be based on true knowledge and ripened with wisdom. Mr. Vice President, why do you keep a plow at your station? The plow is the symbol of labor and tillage of the soil. Without labor, neither knowledge nor wisdom can accomplish much. My duties require me to assist at all times in directing the work of our organization. I preside over meetings in the absence of our president, whose place is beneath the rising sun. Why is the president so stationed? The rising sun is a token of a new era in agriculture. If we will follow the leadership of our president, we shall be led out of the darkness of selfishness and into the glorious sunlight of brotherhood and cooperation. <laughs> Madam President, all officers are at their stations. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. The secretary will call the roll of members. Madam President, members, and guests, I am pleased to announce that at this, the first session of the 90th Pennsylvania FFA State Convention and Activities Week, there are 1,432 members, advisors, and guests registered, Madam President. Thank you. FFA members, why are we here? practice brotherhood, honor agricultural opportunities and responsibilities, and develop those qualities of leadership which FFA membership possess. The chaplain will lead us in an opening reflection. May we assume an attitude of reflection in which we are each most comfortable. Pardon our iniquities, we beseech thee. We thank thee for the marvelous gift of life and the blessings of liberty. We pray that thou manifest thyself and this assembly of the FFA. Harmonize and strengthen our efforts. Bless each member and the group. Amen. May we accomplish our purposes. I now declare this the first session of the 90th Pennsylvania FFA State Convention and Activities Week, duly open for the transaction of business or attention to any matters which may properly be presented. What you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? Bad boys, bad boys. What you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? When you were eight and you had bad treats. At this time to kick off convention this year, we are thankful to have a very special special message from Governor Wolf. Let's take a look. What you 
Hi, I'm Governor Tom Wolf, and I wish that I could be there with you to celebrate the 90th Pennsylvania FFA Convention. This is all we I could be there with you to celebrate the 90th Pennsylvania FFA Convention. This is always a great event, and I'm happy that so many young people are excited and interested in agriculture. One of my priorities over the past four years has been to develop educational and career opportunities across all industries, including agriculture. As FFA members, you are the young leaders who will help us ensure that agriculture has a very bright future. And as you know, ag ed is more than farming. It's science, it's engineering, it's animal health, it's the food we eat three times a day. And with ag ed, you're learning more than the standard courses. You're also learning about independence, leadership, and resilience. We saw that at this year's farm show in Harrisburg. The theme was inspiring Pennsylvania's story and each day you're helping to write that story and to inspire Pennsylvanians, especially me. An example of that inspiration is the great partnership that has been developed between the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Education. They're working more closely than ever so that the state can serve you more directly and help us make good, smart investments in your future. Again, I am proud of everything that you're doing, and I commend the FFA for holding its 90th convention. Good luck to all of the competitors and have a great week. You know, any time throughout history or today, three is a very iconic and powerful number. You know what, buddy? You're right. Just think. There's the Jonas Brothers, Dumb Dumb and Dumber, the Three Blind Mice. Oh, you're right. But you can't forget about, like, the Three Musketeers. Oh, you can't forget about this one. Alvin and the Chipmunks. Ooh. <laughs> you guys are right. Three just really brings out the best in everything. That's why the Backstreet Boys were so big. You know what, guys? The Backstreet Boys were big, but they weren't quite as iconic as us, the Backseat Boys. Yeah, you know, Rourke, you're right. We've had a lot of good times back here, but a lot of good naps and a lot of good laughs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's crazy to think about what the girls would have done if they hadn't had us constantly helping them out from the back seat. Like, you guys remember that one time that Morgan asked us, in all seriousness, what does a street cleaner do? Or that one time when we had to save Abby's neck because she was sleeping in, their hand, in the van with her head at a 90 degree angle. Oh my. And we can't forget about the one time when we were riding in the van once again, and Jenna hit her head off of that seatbelt buckle at least 40 times in one trip. You remember the time Jenna fell down the steps of the Capitol and almost broke her legs? That was kind of funny. And Melina, don't even get me s no. Yeah, actually, she yeah. kind of scares me a little bit, so maybe we just skip over her. Yeah, you guys are right. It's crazy to think about what would have happened if we weren't there helping them out. But you know what's even crazier? What if the girls were just never there at all? I know. I can't even imagine what it would have been like 51 years ago without females being involved in the National FFA organization. So tonight, we're going to recognize the last 50 years of females. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's woo! right. And along with that, we're going to be hearing from our Pennsylvania Secretary of Agriculture. Yeah. And also congratulating our state proficiency winners. Oh, yeah. There you guys go. And we'll also be hearing from members of Agribility and Lead Society. 
From, from the, the backseat back boys to you, welcome to session one. Sister, shoulder, daughter, lover, healer, broken halo, mother, nature, fire, suit of armor, soul survivor, holy water, secret keeper, fortune teller, virgin Mary, scarlet letter, technicolor, river, wild, baby girl, woman, child, female. change. The act of becoming different. In 1917, the Smith-Hughes Act transformed American education forever. Since then, the advancements in agricultural education have not only affected those in agricultural and rural families, but all those around the globe fed and clothed by the American agriculturalist. The condition of being composed of different elements. Formed for young African American men in southern states where schools were segregated by law, the New Farmers of America quickly grew into a national organization exceeding over 100,000 in total membership. In 1965, the FFA merged with the New Farmers of America in hopes of increasing membership across the country. Growth, the progression of development. In 1969, it was passed and changed in our national constitution that female membership into the national FFA organization was officially open, making it possible for them to take agricultural education courses, hold offices, participate in competitive events at multiple levels, and most importantly, wear the blue corduroy jacket. The year 2019 marks 50 years of females being involved in the national FFA organization. We are gathered here to recognize the importance and significance of this historic event that changed the diversity of this organization as it has only continued to grow over the decades. Pictured here is the Pennsylvania delegation at the 1969 National FFA Convention in Kansas City, Missouri. One day, she discovered that she was fierce, strong, and full of fire, and that not even she could hold herself back because her passions burn brighter than her fears. Be that girl that wakes up with passion, purpose, intent, and believes anything is possible. Gracie of the Canton FFA chapter once told me, one day I dream of owning my own farm. Much like agriculture, FFA is an inclusive organization, and there are so many opportunities and experiences that everyone can be involved in. Women, what we love determines what we seek. What we seek determines what we think and do, and what we think and do determines what we will become. I am thankful to wear the blue jacket because it has given me endless opportunities to make a positive difference in those around me. This jacket shaped who I am and I can impact others because of it. Women have always played a vital role in agricultural life. We've worked shoulder to shoulder and hand in hand with our fathers and brothers our husbands and sons, and our friends and colleagues to plant and harvest crops, tend livestock, and make some of the greatest agricultural advancements of our time. But it wasn't until 1969 that women were officially and finally granted membership in the National FFA organization. 50 years later, the story of the long and important effort to allow women in FFA is worth telling. It's also the perfect time to celebrate the wonderful and numerous accomplishments of female FFA members to demonstrate the importance of equity and inclusion of all. There are also women who are early believers in agricultural education. Among them, and one of the most notable, was Charlotte Ware. When she got married in 1895, she was given a Jersey heifer for a marriage gift and she developed a Jersey herd, and in 1909, she started a school in Massachusetts to train women 
to be dairy farmers. And then later on, she became very active in promoting high school agricultural education and was primarily responsible for establishing the Norfolk Agricultural School uh, there in Massachusetts. So women have been involved since the get-go in agriculture. Then the question is, is how about FFA and agricultural education? Rufus Stimson, who introduced the revolutionary idea of experiential learning outside of the classroom, was an early proponent of women in agricultural education. And as I researched Rufus Stimson, I found that he was an advocate for having females in agriculture back in the early 1900s. Whenever you do historical research, one item leads to another item, which leads to another item. The Smith-Hughes Act of 1917 provided federal funds to teach agriculture. While there weren't a lot of young women in agriculture classes at the time, there were some. And nowhere was it more evident than in Massachusetts. The state supervisor of agriculture in Massachusetts in 1922 said, year after year, girls have demonstrated they can profit from our vocational agricultural education. Under such circumstances, we must, of course, agree that there can be no discrimination as to sex and our entrance privileges. Future Farmers of America was established in 1928. The first national FFA convention was held in Kansas City, Missouri, with 33 delegates from 18 states in attendance. Leslie Applegate from New Jersey was elected the first national FFA president. What most people don't realize is in the original constitution of the FFA, it said membership is open to students. It did not say male, it did not say female, it was for students. So <clears throat> that was a mistake, I guess, because in 1930, the FFA constitution was changed to say it was for males. And then all heck broke out in 1933. The Essex chapter of the Future Farmers of America in Massachusetts uh, competed in the national chapter contest. They sent in a roster of their members and the FFA discovered five girls on the roster. They went ballistic. The national president wrote a letter to Massachusetts saying, you gotta fix the problem. So what did Massachusetts do? Well, they said, we don't have a problem. You have the problem. It turns out the Massachusetts Constitution was modeled after the original FFA Constitution, which did not discriminate against women. When the national organization changed the wording to male students in 1930, Massachusetts didn't follow suit. Over several years, Massachusetts, along with a few other eastern states, battled national FFA over the issue. Eventually, an amendment passed that directed FFA to get a ruling from the Massachusetts Attorney General. The state director of vocational education said, that is crazy. You will look like an idiot. Uh, there's been court cases in Massachusetts. There's policy, there's law. It has been proven time and time again in Massachusetts that females cannot be discriminated against. So in 1937, there was a constitutional amendment to the FFA. And the constitutional amendment said, in states where there is laws prohibiting discrimination, females can be members of the FFA at the state level. They cannot participate at the national level. And then things were very quiet for a long, long time, until the 60s. By the late 1960s, several state attorney generals had ruled against FFA in their states resulting in many states allowing women in FFA under the state law provision of the Constitution. But women were still banned from national participation. In 68, it came up for a vote again, and it failed by seven votes. And then <clears throat> it was brought up again in 69, and it passed by two votes. And females were finally allowed membership in the FFA at the national level.
Since 1969, female members have contributed in countless ways throughout FFA. From the first female delegates, Anita Decker and Patricia Krowicki in 1970, to Julie Smiley elected in 1976 as the first female national officer. From Jan Eberly, the organization's first female national president, to Brianna Holbert, the first African-American female elected as national FFA president in 2017. In 2019, women make up 45% of FFA membership. In our upcoming videos, we'll continue to highlight the stories and impact of women on FFA and agriculture. My name is Emma. I'm excited to join FFA next year because I get to join a huge family in which I will learn so many new things about agriculture. Also, I get to do hands-on experiences and learn so much from FFA members, family members, and amazing teachers. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leah New. I'm the current president of Honesville FFA Chapter. This year, I'm competing in the Natural Resources and Aquatics Career Development event. I am thankful for the opportunity to compete and be in FFA for many reasons. One, FFA has opened up so many doors for me. I have been able to restore a tractor as an SAE and even show it in the Pennsylvania Farm Show. I have even had the opportunity to plan many events and activities that haven't been done in my community yet. Because of FFA, I am the person I am today, more outgoing, confident, and excited about a future in agriculture. This organization has shaped me, and I am so thankful for it. When I put my jacket on for the first time, I knew this is where I belong, and I am thankful for FFA and the women before it to make me all possible. Thank you. The women who came before me were leaders, drivers, and spark change. They did not do it for themselves. Together, they did it for the future. A future that I'm thankful enough to be a part of. Each day that I've had the ability to zip up this jacket, I've been reminded of the significance of my opportunity to be the very first harnessed daughter to wear the blue and gold corduroy jacket. And that is most certainly an opportunity that will not end here with me. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. Proverbs 31:25. I learned this verse as a little girl, and I think it is a great representation of women in agriculture education today. Strength. When I think of strength, I think of my mom. She's often called the farmer's wife, but she is so much more than that. She's a mom, a nurse, a cancer survivor, and the backbone of our family farm. And I think of Penny Brammer, who showed us all what a strong female looks like. Dignity. Dignity is defined as being worthy of honor or respect, and I can't help but think about all the dignified women in agriculture education who helped me get here today. I think of the legend Ellen Arendt, who was my first real example of a strong female ag teacher, and I think of Dr. Laura Rice, who believes in me just as much today as she did when I first stepped foot on Penn State's campus. And I think about Joanna McKelvey and Lindsay Wilcox, who inspire me to not only be an awesome FFA advisor, but an awesome mom. And we can laugh without fear of the future because the future of agriculture is strong with women in it. As a current FFA advisor and agriculture educator, I get to work with young women every day who are going to be a part of our future. And I hope I can be the strong, dignified woman like those that were there for me. It has been 40 years since I stood as a Pennsylvania State FFA officer. And to my recollection, there were only five women before that. There was April Green in 72, 73, who, who served with my cousin, Ronald Barker. And then Lindy Lou Morrison came along in 75 and 76. There were two in 77 and 78, Tammy Horner and Ruby Ginder Bollinger. Then there was Tammy Snyder, 
She was the one that I got the privilege of serving as state FFA princess with. The following year was our team with Russell Redding and four awesome, awesome females. We had Dolores Shrump Crick, Cheryl Bollinger Horst, Mary Rice Bolin, and myself, Candy Barker Cooney. And I'm sure since then there has been many, many, many more. Um, think back to the 1970s, a lot of you weren't even thought of by then, but picture this. Our school, I knew I had to be an FFA, I just knew it. But in our school, our administration and our guidance counselor were really hard to convince. So, with the insistence of my parents and my ag teacher, Mr. Roland Dupron, I was the first student enrolled in the Headwaters FFA chapter, or the first female student, excuse me. And my first FFA convention was in Kansas City, Missouri when I was only 14. But when I got out there and I saw that sea of blue jackets rise at the first session that I got to see, I had goosebumps so big, I almost lost my breath. Right then and there, the national blue and corn gold started coursing through my veins so hard, I gave 120% to my project of registered Holsteins and the Headwaters FFA. I was served on many committees, was in contests, served three years as a chapter officer, won a National Dairy Proficiency Award, and on and on and on, and became princess, and you know, that story goes. Um, but anyways, the FFA was, growing up, the FFA was my passion. Um, the FFA has act, actually turned me into the person that I have become, the mom that I, the FFA mom that I am, the successful dairy farmer that I was, and now back to our ag class. Um, last year found my husband and I dispersing our herd of dairy, dairy cattle and to pursue a new career. Well, my career took me back to that same classroom that I loved so much growing up because now I am the vocational specific paraeducator for Mrs. Lacey Miles at the Headwaters FFA chapter up in Potter County. <laughs> There's my guys over there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So whenever I'm with these blue jackets in this room like this, those colors start coursing through my veins again and I feel like I'm wearing the same. I want you to enjoy your life in the FFA and do as much in, in, as you can. Okay, thank you. According to the 2010 United States Census Bureau, the female population reached 157 million. That is estimated to be the equivalent of 50.8% of the United States population. And of those members involved in the national FFA organization, more than 50% of all leadership roles across our country, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands are held by female members. Together, we are the future environmentalists, business owners, teachers, politicians, farmers, and so much more. Together, we are the future of American agriculture. Thank you for taking it upon yourself to change, grow, and diversify this organization. Change, diversity, and growth. In celebration of the 50 years of female membership into the FFA, at this time, we ask that all females in the audience please rise in recognition. If my friends ask where you are, I'm gonna say She went down in an airplane Flying, getting suntan Fell in a cement mix So full of quicksand Help me, help me I'm no good at the night She met a shark on the water Fell in love with water I'll return everything I ever bought her Help me, help me Love you too. Our next guest has been serving as the Senior Associate Dean of the College of Ag Sciences here at Penn State. 
Before that, he was a professor of animal science at the University of Illinois, a program that received top marks as one of the best animal science programs in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcome to the stage your senior associate dean of the College of Ag Sciences, Dr. Stephen Lurch. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Penn State University, home of Creamery Ice Cream and your College of Ag Sciences. <clears throat> I wanna talk about a story going backwards before we think about where we're going in the future. The generation that came before you had a monumental challenge in front of them. They doubled food production during their career per unit of input. Doubled milk production, doubled corn production per acre, doubled the production of pork and tripled the production of poultry. How did they do that, those former farmers of America? They did it with their blood, sweat, and tears. And they did it in collaboration with their land-grant universities. What we do here at Penn State in the College of Ag Sciences, research, teaching, and extension. But we're not just about growing food, are we? All of you in this audience and us on Ag Hill behind me, we're about energy and the environment. We're about food safety, food security, and food affordability. We're about human health and well-being. We're about training the next round of educators, the ag teachers of tomorrow. This is our mission, this is our goal. The marketing of the products that we produce in agriculture, engineering, robotics, drones, precision agriculture, these are the things that we do in the College of Ag Sciences. These things are the future of agriculture in the coming years. In my lifetime, we literally are feeding 160 million more people in this country on 20% less land. Think about that. How are we gonna double food production in the future to meet the needs of a growing population? The answer to that question is sitting in front of me right here, the future farmers of America. I challenge you, I congratulate you, and I thank you. As I participate in this convention this evening, I'm gratified and, and assured that our future in the United States is secure because it is in your hands. So congratulations, welcome to Penn State, and I hope you have a great, here, a great week here in Happy Valley. Thank you. Dr. Lurch, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Your support for the agricultural industry and the future generations of agricultural leaders is truly appreciated. Please join me in thanking the Senior Associate Dean of the College of Agriculture Sciences. Even nobody does Cause you miss it too much May we all know that nothing ain't cool Till you wear the new off the sound of a quarter Rolling down the jukebox Play the Travis Tread right above this year, several students took the time to step into their agriculture teacher's shoes to teach a class for the day. After teaching a lesson on a topic of their choosing, they wrote an essay describing their experience. Not only did those participating better their education skills, but they also had a chance to truly appreciate the work that their teachers do day in and day out. Joining us today is Thomas Gable to share with us the winners of the Penn State Teach Ag Essay Contest. Let's hear it for the Lead Society at Penn State. Hello, Pennsylvania FFA. How are we doing tonight? My name is Thomas Gable. I'm a student here at Penn State majoring in agricultural and extension education and also the public relations director for LEAD Society. And I have the honor and privilege tonight of being able to announce our Teach Ag Essay Contest Awards. However, I feel like some of us in the audience may have one question on their minds right now. What is LEAD Society? Well, LEAD itself stands for Literacy, Education, and Agricultural Development, as our club looks for opportunities to give back and advocate for the industry. 
An elite society was formed as a merger between collegiate FFA and Teach Ag Society, bringing these two together into one cohesive club. It also is a way to actually connect FFA students in our the former FFA students in the Penn State College of Agricultural Sciences, giving them an opportunity to advocate and give back to their communities through service. So if any of you in the audience are looking towards doing something further with FFA in college and will be looking at Penn State, that's my recru recruiting plug for the night. Past the recruiting spe little spiel right there. One thing that we kept from Teach Ag Society through our merger is the Teach Ag Essay Contest. This year, we had 13 participants representing nine schools from across the state. Now, these participants developed a lesson plan, went into a classroom, and taught the class for the day. They also created an optional YouTube video for extra credit, and then submitted an essay in addition to that, all for review by a committee who determined four finalists who will be up on stage with us tonight. Now, as we continue to look towards improving our contest, we tried to make it more theme centralized this year, with the theme being to infinity and beyond and taking a spin on it, looking at the global side and how we can make agricultural sustainable. The essay prompt this year was simply, how can agricultural education meet the growing global demands in the year 2050? So all participants answered that question in, addi in addition to teaching their lesson. Now this contest began in 2014, and since then we've been pressed by a whole abundance of students stepping in and stepping into the stooge of their agricultural educators. And we also like to recognize our past winners each year, with 2014 being Kevin Dressler from Sealands Grove. The next year was Caitlin Browse from Mifflinburg, Thomas Gable from Newport, Brandon Bixler from Garden Spot High School, and last year's winner, Makara Anderson from Southern Huntington County High School. Let's hear it for our past winners. Now, each of our finalists on stage will be receiving an award. And if you're interested in the contest in the future, these are rewards that you could be receiving as well. Fourth place, receiving a $25 gift card to the National FFA store. Then third place, receiving a $50 gift card. Second place, $75. And first place, receiving a $100 gift card and free registration to an FFA event over the next school year. All participants receive a free Teach Ag Essay Contest t-shirt and invitation to our ice cream social which I will talk about near the end of my presentation. Now, at this time, we'd like to thank our sponsors for the event, the Pennsylvania FFA Association, the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania FFA Alumni and Supporters, the Pennsylvania Association of Agricultural Educators, and the Center for Professional Personnel Development at Penn State. Without their support, this contest would not be possible. Let's give them a round of applause. Now, at this time, could our four finalists come downstage? Being Cheyenne Bastion Brown, Brandon Bixler, and Jessica Herr, and give me a second. I had this written down on my paper, and somehow it didn't end up in the final copy. They know who they are. They're coming. Amanda, there you go, Amanda Hamilton. <laughs> Apologies to everyone. And as we're getting ready to reveal these results, I'd like to welcome one more individual to the stage. Coming back, our Senior Associate Dean for the College of Agricultural Sciences, Dr. Steve Lurch, who will be presenting our awards. And now for the results. In fourth place is Cheyenne Bastion Brown from the Canton FFA chapter with her lesson, to infinity and beyond, saving the environment one cup of milk at a time. Congratulations, Cheyenne. In third place is Brandon Bixler from the Grassland FFA chapter. He taught his class a lesson titled Energy and Food Solutions for a Growing World. Congratulations, Brandon. In second place is Amanda Hamilton from the Cumberland Valley FFA chapter. With her lesson, The Faces of Malnutrition. Congratulations, Amanda. And our winner of the 2019 Teach Ag Essay Contest is Jessica Herr from the Garden Spot FFA chapter with her lesson titled, The Tools for Sustainability. Congratulations, Jessica. We will be giving you guys your gift cards in a little bit when we have you off stage. We'll get Dr. Lurch with you as well. 
And at this time, can we get a round of applause for all of our participants of the essay contest? You guys, go ahead and come off stage. <laughs> now, our ice cream social, who doesn't like free ice cream? For our 13 participants, they'll all be invited to this. This will be in Finley Commons near FFA headquarters. Look for me. I will have signs pointing you in the direction of the ice cream social. That will be held immediately following session. So just meet over there in Finley Commons for some ice cream. Now, at Penn State, we love to create opportunities to have students engaged in different learning opportunities. And one of them has been the Teach Ag Essay Contest. But the Center for Professional Personnel Development unveiled a new challenge this year, the Pennsylvania Ag Ed STEM Challenge. Now, it is my honor and privilege to introduce one individual who is an associate professor of agricultural education at the Penn State College of Agricultural Sciences and a personal mentor of mine, Dr. Daniel Foster. I'm hoping that Thomas was joking about losing those four names. We'll have to talk about that later. That might impact his grades in future classes. We'll find out. Hey, do you know what I love? I love innovators. Hey, I love explorers, adventurers. I love pioneers, people who are not afraid to do something that's new, that's never been done before, rebels. Those who look up and say, wouldn't it be cool if are those that say, well, why not? Do you know why I love that? You better listen close. I love that because we have to have that. We, yeah, that you and me, all of us here, face a world of wicked challenges that are interconnected that deal with climate change to environmental factors, to ecological, to biological, all of it grounded in agriculture, so we need innovators who can come and take a problem, think critically, be creative, collaborate with others, and perhaps design and build something. So I'm really proud that my good friend John Seaman decided to create an event, to facilitate event through the center. Of course, you can't do great events without great partners like Orc and Pest Management and of course the Pennsylvania Winery Association. But for the first time ever, because we know that it's agricultural students who will solve our world problems in the future, for the first time ever, we had the PA Ag STEM Design Build Challenge. They came and they presented. There were 20 teams. Guys, I've been involved with Pennsylvania FA for about a decade now at this event. For the pilot year to have 20 different teams, that puts it at one of the most highly participated events at this convention. And of those 20 teams, they were tasked. Now, I'm going to read this to make sure I don't mess it up. They were tasked with designing, building, and testing prototypes to combat the state's spotted lantern fire crisis. We're going to get that bug. We're going to get rid of it. And y'all are going to help us do it. Well, five teams were selected from evaluation today to come back as finalists on National Teach Ag Day, because teachers matter. On National Teach Ag Day on September the 19th, come back to Penn State and be selected for the national, for the winner of this new event. So it is indeed my honor to read off these five finalist names. And then I know you're gonna cheer real loud like I know Pennsylvania FFA members are uniquely qualified to do. So let's hold those cheers until I get through all five and let's see how loud we can get for innovation, for enthusiasm, and for those who don't fear something that's new and different of signing up and trying. So here we go, the five finalists. Turkeyfoot High School with Hostetler, Khan, Rugg, and Little. Southern Huntington High School with Anderson, Taylor, Goshen, and House. Conrad Weiser High School with Horick and Moyer. Bedford County Technical Center with Broyle, Deal, DuPont, and Whitmer. And the last finalist team, Monroe Career and Technical Center of Ronco, Telaza, Cosgrove, and Small. Just give a round of applause. How loud can you get? <laughs> we'll see you in September. Thank you. Being an ag teacher and FFA advisor is a career like no other. 
Their talents and knowledge help in providing our members with unlimited opportunities and choices throughout their FFA journeys. We would like to thank Lead Society for putting on this amazing contest, and thank you, Thomas, for coming on the behalf tonight. We would also like to thank Dr. Lurch and Dr. Foster for their commitment and passion to agriculture education and the Pennsylvania FFA Association. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. But you can't be too far gone Cause what happens in a small town Stays in a small town Every main road we've ever gone down Friday night bleachers, Sunday pews Ain't a county line mile without a memory of you Every whisper, every room I won't get Every time the ball center fills it up the purpose of AgriBility is to assist farmers or other agricultural workers with disabilities or long-term health conditions by providing them the resources and support that they need to live independently and to continue working in or return to production agriculture. We are so thankful that AgriBility PA and the Pennsylvania FFA Association can partner together to assist passionate individuals in agriculture. With us today, we have Miss Abby Spackman and Dr. Connie Baggett from AgriBility. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Good evening. I'd like to thank FFA for allowing us to announce our contest winners this evening. Uh, again, I'll just share with you that AgriBility PA works with farmers in Pennsylvania who have disabilities or health conditions, and our goal is to help them remain active in agriculture. We have a contest for FFA students so that they can participate with us in helping us keep farmers farming. This year, we had a lot of great entries and we were really excited to review all of the awesome work that these FFA students and chapters did. And this year we are selecting winners from two of our contest categories. We are selecting from the category of designing an assistive technology model or demonstration and there will be a winner from the category of completing a community service project centered around helping people with disabilities. And I am going to have Dr. Baggett announce our winners. And when he announces you, if you could come up to the stage for your award, we would appreciate it. Yes, I'm so pleased to be here tonight. It is a great occasion because farmers in Pennsylvania and many other states as well work 24-7, 365 days out of the year. And because of this commitment, some of them do experience accidents. They have some diseases that pre prevent them from continuing their work. The AgriBuilder Project has been in effect for over 20, 20 years, going on 25 years. So tonight, we want to recognize FFA chapters who have participated in a very important program to combat some of the issues that farmers are facing. So tonight, I would like to ask Pegway Valley to come forward, the FFA chapter, please. A representative, a representative from Pegway Valley. Is Pegway here? They're coming, they're coming. It takes a minute or two for them to get here. Anyway, while they're coming here, I'm going to let them come up and pronounce their name because I do not want to mess it up. So come over here and just give us your name. Oh, uh, where? Oh, Naeli Argueta and Adrian Yothers. Yes. Thanks. And we want to take some pictures that we present as we present this. So let's move to the center, please. And so we can show it to everyone. While they're taking pictures, I'll just share with you quickly about the project that they completed. 
They designed a feeder and an app to go along with this feeder that would enable a farmer to feed their horses or livestock through an app that they actually set up and tested and it worked really well. They sent us videos and we were very impressed. So thank you for the work that you guys put into this project. So our next, our next uh, winner is Grassland FFA. So could I get some of uh, the representatives from Grassland to come forward, please? Be Brandon and the service team. It may take a minute, may take a minute as well for that, those individuals to get here. While we're waiting, because I hear they're on their way, <laughs> I'll share with you a little bit about their project. They worked at Saddle Creek Farm, which is the farm of a past AgriAbility clients, and they spent a day working there to replace stall mats and to make the barn and stall area more accessible. So we're very thankful for the work that they did for Saddle Creek Farm. And I also want to thank the FFA uh, advisor for working with these fine individuals, for them to do a, such a nice job with their presentation and project. Thank you. I also want to recognize, and if you guys could give a round of applause, we had some honorable mentions. Again, we were very impressed with all of the uh, projects that we had to review. Um, and we had a couple uh, that you can see up here on the screen. So let's just give all of those who participated a round of applause. And I just want to say thank you again to FFA for allowing us to put on this contest and for all of the FFA students who help support AgriAbility. Thank you. Ms. Spackman and Dr. Baggett, thank you so much for supporting the future of agriculture. What you do for Pennsylvania farmers and agriculturalists is outstanding, and your partnership with the Pennsylvania FFA Association is appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it one more time for AgriBility. I got the horses in the back, horse stock is attached. Head is mad at black, got the boosters black to match. Riding on a horse, ha, you can whip your horse. I've been in the valley. Our next guest is no stranger to agriculture or the FFA, having worn the Battlefield FFA jacket followed by the Association jacket. He served as the 1978-1979 State FFA Vice President and always makes time to stop and talk with the blue and gold. He is a graduate of Penn State University, having earned a bachelor's and master's degree in agriculture and extension education. He currently resides in the Gettysburg area with his wife, Nina, and his two sons, Garrison and Elliot. Just recently, he was confirmed to serve another term as the 26th Pennsylvania Secretary of Agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming to the stage the Pennsylvania Secretary of Agriculture, Russell Redding. Hey, thank you uh, for the kind introduction. Good evening, everybody. An honor to be here. It's an honor to be with you uh, tonight, and particularly when we get a chance to celebrate a 50-year anniversary of women uh, in the FFA. We did something really smart, right? We started out as a, as a male organization and added the females. Uh, we got a lot better. The day that happened, we got a lot better. So uh, congratulations to the FFA, uh, each of the women who are here who've been part of that. We heard a few tonight tell their stories and uh, both uh, the story of and, and those who are perspective looking forward. Uh, thank you for what you do. I say often that this jacket is a transformative jacket, right? Uh, we start out uh, as individuals, we end as a team. We start out as an organization of men and we end as an organization of women and men. 
it is transformative. We see it each year as our officer team, seven individuals that come together. And then you end as a team. And we see the power of that jacket tonight one more time. So I want to say thank you to Mr. Brammer and the team for a phenomenal year. It's hard to believe that in a short, it's been a short year. I'm sure to the officers uh, who've traveled the miles, have done the work, uh, it may seem longer. But a note of thanks on behalf of the department for what this officer team does. Uh, they wear uh, the blue and gold, very proud, and do an amazing job. We know that this corduroy jacket is a uniter. Uh, we know that uh, we are united by the fundamentals of agriculture. Dr. Lurch spoke of, of what our work has done and what our task is. Uh, it is a moment when I think every one of us, when you look around and, and the work of this organization, the Blue and Gold, uh, what we have done in the years since its formation, since 1928, uh, every one of us who are associated with the most honorable of professions in agriculture should stand and say thank you to those who came before us and the science and the power and the innovation that we have heard tonight. There has been another uh, team just as diverse that has come together this past year. And I'm going to ask the Pennsylvania Commission on Agriculture Education Excellence members to join me on stage tonight. I'm very honored to introduce to you for the first time uh, a group of individuals who are uh, in a, an official capacity. You heard the governor in the introduction speak of the importance of agriculture. Uh, and the work that education and agriculture is doing together. That is true. One of the best examples of that is the formation of the commission which was created by an act of the legislature. And that's important. This isn't an executive order by the governor to say that education and agriculture are important. This is our elected leaders in the state, along with the executive branch, saying we need to look at the education of agriculture here in Pennsylvania, guide it, inspire it, uh, and this is the group of individuals who uh, will lead that. We know that agriculture is changing. We know that. We look back just a few years and we've heard it tonight, but just look forward a few years. If what is back is any indication of what's forward, we need an amazing group of teachers, we need an amazing group of uh, students, uh, in agriculture and the science and the best thinkers uh, tonight. But we also need folks who are visionary as commission members to help lead ag education in Pennsylvania. So I'm very pleased tonight to uh, introduce to you our commission members. Now this group is diverse uh, as agriculture is as well. Uh, they represent the diversity of perspectives across uh, industry sectors, academia, government, and those who have their fingers on the pulse, not only of our biggest challenges, but importantly, solutions to those challenges. So I want to recognize uh, these folks tonight. I want to introduce them to you. Uh, we do not, do not have all members here. Uh, we have some, but I'll introduce all of the members to you. Uh, Brian Smith, uh, who is a dairy farmer and a Wayne County commissioner. Uh, Cliff Wallace, uh, who is here, a uh, crop farmer and retired agriculture instructor. Just give a wave, Cliff. <laughs> Jennifer Zimmerman, manager of Shade Mountain Winery. Dr. Kevin Curry, assistant professor of agriculture extension education here at Penn State. <laughs> Carol Hardbarger, uh, ag science and educational consultant who also serves on the Pennsylvania Milk Marketing Board. Uh, Senator Judy Schwank, who is a minority chair of the Senate Ag Committee in Pennsylvania uh, and also a state system of higher education board member. Tiffany Turrentine, uh, small animal. I, I, I should know just to pause, right? To our Saul friends, welcome. Uh, uh, Tiffany, uh, small animal veterinary technology instructor at uh, Seoul High School. Anthony Honeycutt, agriculture education <laughs> teacher at Northwestern High School. Dr. Yuri Zhang, uh, professor of horticulture at Westmoreland County Community College. Uh, Mr. Gary Swan, Pennsylvania FFA Foundation Board of Directors. 
and retired uh, Pennsylvania Farm Bureau Director of Governmental Affairs. Uh, Mr. Lee Grashek, Central Pen Columbia School District. Dr. Lee Burkett, the Director in the Bureau of Career and Technical Education, the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Uh, Matthew Stem, Deputy Secretary for the Pennsylvania Department of Education. There are two co-chairs. Uh, I am one, and I share that responsibility with Secretary Rivera, the Secretary of Education uh, here in Pennsylvania. And this commission is led by uh, Dr. Robert Clark, our Commission Executive Director. This commission has important work to do. Uh, the legislature and the governor were very direct in their statute and, and giving us the charge of our duty to look at ag education in Pennsylvania. Not just status, but how to grow it. How do we bring more chapters on board and more programs on board? We had a great conversation today. Uh, but this commission knows the task before, him, before them. Uh, we understand that in Pennsylvania, if we were a country, we'd be the 14th largest economy in the nation. 14. Sixth largest employer across the world. The demographics, as we spoke of tonight, for agriculture are changing. But what is true is we need the best minds. We need the best science. We need folks who understand the power of food to change lives. Right? That's what you do, that's what we do, that's what the commission is entrusted to do. So tonight we say thank you to each of the commission members for uh, saying yes, for serving in this capacity. We say thank you to the governor and the legislature who saw uh, the future and saying we need to prepare for it. So on behalf of the Department of Agriculture, on behalf of my co-chair and colleague, Secretary Revere, I want to say thanks uh, to each of you, to each of the commission members for serving. The final point is we are inspired tonight, and every time I come back to this convention 40 years later, 44 years as an FFA member, I stood as a green hand with Mr. George Glenn, uh, my instructor, teaching me the creed. And to this day, the two most powerful words in the English language are, I believe. I believe, right? It's what we do every single day. We believe in the future of agriculture. And you come here tonight and we see this and we say, uh, we'll be fine. We'll do well because we're inspired and we believe. So all the best to you. Thank you to the FFA and to our commission. Thank you. Secretary Redding and all of our members of the Agid Commission, thank you for constantly looking to further ag education. And Secretary Redding, congratulations on 40 years post-state office. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have one more round of applause for Secretary Redding and our Agricultural Education Commission. From agricultural sales to vegetable production, there are nearly 50 areas that FFA members can earn proficiency awards in. Through their supervised agricultural experiences, these members have developed specialized skills that they can use in their future careers. Students can earn these awards in placement through internships or employment, in entrepreneurship through ownership of an ag-based enterprise, in a combined placement entrepreneurship project or in agri-science research through planning and conducting of an experiment. All of these members have certainly gone above and beyond, and we look forward to seeing them represent Pennsylvania and their respective proficiencies at the National FFA Convention and Expo in Indianapolis this fall. Let's sit back and learn all about the following proficiency winners.
state winner of the Agricultural Communications Proficiency is Benjamin Miskin from the Cumberland Valley FFA Chapter. Ben's SAE project is on draft horse production and his year serving as the 2017 Draft Horse Ambassador. He was able to educate the public by speaking and attending state shows and fairs, while representing and promoting Pennsylvania's draft horse owners, breeders, and the industry. Ben received his Keystone State degree this year and plans to have future career in veterinary medicine. Congratulations to Benjamin Miskin, our state proficiency winner in the area of agricultural communications. Our state finalist in the area of agricultural education is Brandon Bixler. Brandon is a state winner in a different category, but will still be accepting the award as making it as a finalist in this category. Great job, Brandon. Our state finalists in the area of agricultural processing are Rebecca High and Vanica Rice. In the area of agricultural processing, our state proficiency winner is Vanica Rice from the Williamsburg FFA chapter. Vanica's SAE project is working on her family's dairy farm and cheese business. Her family's farm milks her 50 cows solely for the sale of raw milk and cheese. She has duties both on the farm and in the cheese plant. She won third place in the Pennsylvania Farm Show Cheese Competition with her feta cheese that she made. Vanica received her Keystone State degree at the Midwinter Convention this year. In the future, she plans to attend college, majoring in animal science, then returning to the farm to become the cow herd manager. Congratulations to Vanica Rice, our state proficiency winner in the area of agricultural processing. The state winner of the Agricultural Sales Entrepreneurship Proficiency is Wyatt Emig from the Bermudian FFA Chapter. Wyatt's SAE is propagating, then selling his produce and plants from his greenhouses and gardens. He started his business in his high school greenhouse, and then over time it blossomed into his own greenhouses. He propagates and sells bedding plants, hanging baskets, container pots, and vegetable plants and produce. Every year, he has a spring and fall open house sale, where he takes the money made from sales and puts it back into his business for future years. Wyatt plans to take courses in business and marketing with hopes of later becoming a greenhouse owner. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for our state proficiency winner in the area of agricultural sales, entrepreneurship, Wyatt Emig. Our state finalists in the area of agricultural sales placement are Brandon Bixler, and Heather Ballant. The winner of the agricultural sales placement state proficiency is Brandon Bixler of the Grassland FFA chapter. Brandon's SAE project is his employment at Martin's Trailside Express. He's been working there since 2017, and throughout the years he's held multiple shift positions, working his way up to shift leader. Brandon received his Keystone State degree this year, and his future plans are to attend the Pennsylvania State University, majoring in agricultural education and extension, and plans to become an agricultural educator. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for our state proficiency winner in the area of agricultural sales placement, Brandon Bixler. In the area of agricultural research animal systems, our state proficiency winner is Erlen Oatman from the Manor FFA chapter. Erlen's SAE is an ongoing research investigating the nutritional impacts of raw foods and store-bought feeds in small animals. She initiated her research when her dog got diagnosed with stomach cancer and she formulated a feed to help her gain weight. 
Her research has expanded to present day using 12 rats, testing for abnormal blood glucose levels based on diet and weight. Erilyn plans to become an animal nutritionist and own an animal feed business, along with doing her own independent research in the future. In addition, at the Midwinter Convention, she received her Keystone State degree. Pennsylvania FFA, our state proficiency winner in the area of the Agricultural Research Animal Systems, Erilyn Oatman. Our state finalists in the area of Agricultural Research Integrated Systems are Cassie Stoller, Guy Williams, and Garen Hoy. In the area of Agricultural Research Integrated Systems, our state proficiency winner is Guy Williams of the Tyrone Area FFA Chapter. Guy's SAE dealt with the filtration properties of soil and the various causes and effects of such on the environment. He sought out professionals in the field of soil sciences, such as farm and business owners, a geologist, soils inspector. He learned valuable information from them. From the first year, he doubled his experimental sample size and added another variable to his research. He plans to pursue a career in either nursing or the agricultural field in the future. He is an active member of his FFA chapter, serving as the Sentinel, and he received his Keystone State degree this year. Pennsylvania FFA, our state proficiency winner in the area of Agricultural Research Integrated Systems, Guy Williams. Our state finalists in the area of beef production entrepreneurship are Maddie Musser, Austin Crone, and Rebecca Radel. The state winner of the Beef Production Entrepreneurship Proficiency is Maddie Musser of the Elizabethtown FFA Chapter. Maddie's SAE project is raising and showing steers. She's been showing for five years and has grown her SAE over time and shows at many fairs and jackpots. She received her Keystone State degree last year and is now a freshman at Penn State majoring in agribusiness management. She plans on using her degree to help farmers and agricultural businesses make sound financial decisions. Congratulations to Maddie Musser, our state proficiency winner in the area of beef production entrepreneurship. Hey Abby, guess what time it is? It's t-shirt time! Who wants a t-shirt? Our state finalist in the area of dairy production entrepreneurship is Austin Cobb. Although there is although there is no state winner in this category, Austin is being recognized tonight for his hard work in this area of placement. Congratulations and great job, Austin! Our state finalists in the area of dairy production placement are Vanica Rice, Joe Allman, and Kirsten Kowick.
The state winner of the Dairy Production Placement Proficiency is Kirsten Kowick from the Shippensburg FFA you're right, chapter. You're, you're right. Okay, yeah, you're next. So just sneak up, Jake. Work with Kirsten's SAE is working on her family's dairy farm. Her duties have grown over time to now taking on the responsibilities of milking cows, feeding calves, caring for husbandry needs, daily herd health, and record keeping. She received her Keystone State degree this year, and in the future, she yes. plans to attend Virginia Tech with a major in dairy science and a minor in pre-vet, then become a large animal veterinarian with a focus in dairy science. Congratulations, Kirsten Kowick, our state proficiency winner in the area of dairy production placement. She already passed. Our state finalists in the area of diversified agriculture production are Ethan Brummer, and Dara Yerger. The winner of the Diversified Agricultural Production is Ethan Brummer of the Greenwood FFA Chapter. Ethan's SAE project is growing grain and field crops and livestock on his family farm. He has over 500 acres of crops and is an active part of ensuring all aspects of crop production are carried out fully. He also takes part in the livestock production on the farm with Angus cattle, swine, and lambs. He has received his Keystone State degree this year and plans to attend the Pennsylvania State University and later have a career in production agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for our state proficiency winner in the area of diversified agricultural production, Ethan Brummer. Our state finalists in the area of diversified horticulture are Morgan Harnish and Alyssa Bieber. The winner of diversified horticulture is Alyssa Bieber from the Grand Canyon FFA chapter. Alyssa's SAE entails many small projects at her home including raising indoor plants for her family, keeping a backyard greenhouse, having a small aquaponic system set up in her living room, and helping her grandfather on his farm, and also working at Martin's Garden Center. Most of her time was spent watering, turning, pruning, evaluating plants, and managing displays. She recently received her Keystone State degree this year at the Midwinter Convention. In the future, she plans to enlist in the military and obtain a career working with science to help protect our country. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for our state proficiency winner in the area of diversified horticulture, Alyssa Bieber. Our state finalists in the area of diversified livestock production are Emma Musser, Mackenzie Myers, Leah Welk, and Ryan France. In the area of diversified livestock production, our state proficiency winner is Leah Welk from the Garden Spot FFA chapter. Leah's SAE project is entrepreneurships with market hogs, market lambs, and market goats, where she works with her livestock for summer fairs and jackpot shows, then gets more market animals for the Pennsylvania Farm Show. She was an active member in her FFA chapter. She plans to attend the Penn State to major in agricultural sciences with a minor in animal science, then plans to pursue a job in the agribusiness field in the future. Pennsylvania FFA, our state proficiency winner in the area of diversified livestock production, Leah Welk. In the area of environmental science and natural resources, our state proficiency winner is Emily Stambaugh of the Big Spring FFA chapter. Emily's SAE is working with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation as a student leader. As a student leader, she works on a student action plan, where her plan is centered around a riparian buffer zone on a local farm. She records growth of vegetation and performs water quality tests. Emily is also tasked with making decisions that will benefit and improve the buffer and the surrounding land. 
She received her Keystone State degree and in the future plans to obtain a degree in agribusiness management and agricultural and extension education. Pennsylvania FFA, our state proficiency winner in the area of environmental sciences and natural resources, Emily Stambaugh. Our state finalists in the area of equine science entrepreneurship are Dar Darby Conrad and Dorothy Bollinger. The state winner of the equine science entrepreneurship proficiency is Darby Conrad from the Manor FFA chapter. Darby's SE project is her rodeo horses. She owns and works and trains all horses that she runs in rodeos. She ropes, barrel races, and goat ties. She plans to become an equine chiropractor and is an active member of her chapter. Congratulations to Darby Conrad, our state proficiency winner in the area of equine science entrepreneurship. Our state finalists in the area of equine science placement are Mandy Baker, Jessica McKay, and Ben Miskin. The state winner of the equine science placement proficiency is Jessica McKay from the Gifford Pincho FFA chapter. Jessica's SAE is the horses she takes care of at Smith's Farm. The farm currently has four horses, including two quarter horses, one paint, and one Appaloosa. Her daily routine includes feeding, watering, cleaning stalls, and making sure that the horses always have access to hay. Her responsibilities are to keep the horses healthy and evaluate for illness and lameness. She is an active member in her chapter, and her future plans are to obtain a bachelor's degree for agricultural business. Congratulations to Jessica McKay, our state proficiency winner in the area of equine science placement proficiency. Hey Sam, look who's coming. Is that Greg and Grace, the terrific t-shirt duo? T-shirt. <laughs> Our state finalists in the area of goat production are Mary Gant, Skylar Anderson, and Carly Naylor. The winner of the goat production state proficiency is Skylar Anderson of the Mannheim FFA chapter. Skylar's SE project is raising, showing, then selling her projects. Over the years, she has expanded her SAE not only by the number of goats she has, but also the numbers of shows she went to. In addition to feeding, washing, and fitting her goats, she really focused on adding exercise to their daily routine and bracing them when setting up. She is an active member of her chapter, received her keystone this year, and her career goal is to become a veterinary technician. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for our state proficiency winner in the area of goat production, Skylar Anderson. The winner of the nursery operation state proficiency is Allison Rice of the Midwest FFA chapter. Allison's SAE is her greenhouse and plant care. 
where she sustainably grew 35 different species of plants, including annual and perennial flowers and herbs, vegetable starters, and hanging baskets. She grew all of the plants and hosted a sale in May. Allison researches plant illness, waters correctly, estimates trimming, propagation, and transplants correctly. She received her Keystone State degree at the Midwinter Convention and plans to major in agriculture education and horticulture with a minor in Spanish. She then wants to work for the Environmental Protection Agency in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for our state proficiency winner in the area of nursery operations, Allison Rice. Our state finalists in the area of poultry production are Megan Heggy, Harley Brooks, Tobias Lehman, and Sarah Bleacher. In the area of poultry production, our state proficiency winner is Harley Brooks from the Grand Canyon FFA chapter. Harley's SE project is raising and showing broilers. Ressie went from just raising chickens to collect eggs for her family to showing at the county fair, raising broilers, and hatching eggs. She's an active member in her FFA chapter and received her Keystone State degree this year. She plans to attend college and major in nursing, along with using the knowledge that she gained from her SAE projects to develop her own small flock of chickens. Pennsylvania FFA, our state proficiency winner in the area of poultry production, Harley Brooks. Our state finalists in the area of sheep production are Trent Molly, and Nicole Lorenz. In the area of sheep production, our state proficiency winner is Trent Molly of the Wilmington FFA chapter. Trent's SAE is raising, breeding, and showing market lambs. Today, he has about 70 head in his flock at any given time. Trent's responsibilities include vaccinating the sheep, managing feed rations, and maintaining housing conditions. He received his Keystone State degree, and in the future, he plans to raise sheep and become an electrician. He one day hopes to own his own business. Pennsylvania FFA, our state proficiency winner in the area of sheep production is Trent Molly. Our state finalists in the area of small animal production and care are Lily Hansberry and Rachel J. The state winner of the Small Animal Production and Care Proficiency is Rachel J. from the West Perry FFA Chapter. Rachel's SE project is raising Californian rabbits to breed and then sell. She ensures that the rabbits have a safe, sanitary, and warm environment to be in, along with keeping accurate rep records on the rabbits and making decisions pertaining to weight, feed, and breeding. She plans to get her bachelor's degree in accounting and possibly minor in business administration. She also received her Keystone State degree this year. Congratulations to Rachel J, our state proficiency winner in the area of small animal production and care proficiency. Our state finalist in the area of specialty animal production placement is Jolene Fields. Although there's no state winner in this category, Jolene is being recognized tonight for her hard work and dedication in this area of placement. Congratulations and great job, Jolene. Our state finalists in the area of swine production are Daniel Wagner and Rebecca High. The state winner of the Swine Production Entrepreneurship Proficiency is Rebecca High from the Manor FFA Chapter. Rebecca's SAE is raising swine for market. She started out with two pigs and now has grown her herd and where she shows her swine. 
Becca learned the fundamental care and showmanship principles for raising swine, and she knows how to calculate an average weight of gain per combination of pounds of pellet food and pounds of beet pulp. She received her Keystone State degree and is an active member in her chapter, and her future plans are to attend the Pennsylvania College of Technology to earn a bachelor's degree in pastry art and hospitality business management. Afterwards, she plans to open a bakery where she hopes to promote agriculture and embody the farm-to-fork idea of bringing farm-fresh foods to the table. Congratulations to Rebecca High, our state proficiency winner in the area of swine production entrepreneurship. The winner of the vegetable production state proficiency is Grace O'Toole of the West Perry FFA chapter. Grace's SAE project is a series of raised bed gardens she uses for vegetable production. A key component of her project is using the produce to feed her family and community. She gave away a variety of vegetables at church, donated produce for a mission trip, and has experimented in the kitchen, incorporating many vegetables into cooking. She's an active member in her chapter, and her future plans are to complete a six-year doctorate of pharmacy at one of the colleges she was accepted into. She would then like to graduate and become a clinical pharmacist. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for our state proficiency winner in the area of vegetable production, Grace O'Toole. The winner of the Wildlife Production and Management State Proficiency is Taylor Wheeler of the Grand Canyon FFA Chapter. Taylor's SAE is working for the Thunder Ridge Game Farm. This farm offers a wide range of outdoor recreational activities including sporting clays, game hunting, and pitching shoots. He is responsible for the health and welfare of the animals as well as training new employees. He received his Keystone State degree at Midwinter Convention and plans to attend college for environmental science and obtain a career as a game warden in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for our state proficiency winner in the area of wildlife production and management, Taylor Wheeler. Congratulations to all of our state proficiency finalists and winners. Your hard work and dedication is something we all should learn from. Let's give them one more round of applause. up, my brother and I thought that we were pretty great scientists. And one of our most famous experiments was we would take the old plastic film containers, fill them with just a little bit of baking soda and just the right amount of vinegar, close the caps, run away, and watch them just explode. Now, my brother and I thought that we were pretty great scientists at the time, but these next individuals have an explosive curiosity and an even greater love of science. These next individuals have tested their own hypothesis through their own agri-science fair projects. They have conducted research and presented their findings through an essay and an interview process held at the Pennsylvania Farm Show. Here to help us recognize these next individuals is the chair of the agri-science fair committee, Mr. Adam Searfoss. Thank you very much. Good evening, Pennsylvania FFA. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the AgriScience Fair recognizes student researchers studying the application of scientific principles and emerging technologies in agricultural enterprises. This year, we had over 120 entries in the six different categories and six different divisions, with members ranging from grades seven through 12, entering either individually or as a team of two. Project topics this year varied greatly and included student researchers who tested lactose-free milk using high-performance liquid chromatography, 
to students inventorying and identifying tick species collected during the fall hunting season. We had students use 3D printers to investigate water drainage in soil containers, and others analyzed water samples for the presence of plastic microfibers. For those of you who have not competed in the agri-science fair, I encourage you to find your passion and find your interest in the agricultural sciences and ask a question. That question, that question can drive you to solving a problem, developing a research hypothesis, and solving the problems that we face heading into the future. All of our state champions about to be recognized on stage will be applying to the national convention, and if they're selected as one of the top 12, they will participate this coming October at the national convention. Pennsylvania FFA, your state champions are in the category of Animal Systems, Division Three, Grace Diskin from Cumberland Valley. Division Four, the team of Jay Bratton and Andrea Clark from Greenwood. Division Five, Erilyn Tegmeyer Oatman from Manor. Division Six, the team of McKenna LaRosa and JC Whitcomb from Tyrone. For the Environmental Services and Natural Resources category, Division Three, Carly Diebold from Tyrone. <laughs> Division Four, the team of Eliana Yatron and Allison Carneal from Conrad Weiser. <laughs> Division Five, Makira Anderson from Southern Huntington. In the category of Food Products and Processing Systems, Garen Hoy from Tyrone. The team of Cara France and Curran Chesniak from Conrad Weiser. For Division 5 in Food Products and Processing, Bryn Worley, Conrad Weiser. She was also named Best of Show. Moving on to the plant systems category, Division Three, Therese Coleman, Conrad Weiser. Next, the team of Carl and John Price from Danville. For Division Five, Matt Bird, Cumberland Valley. and the team of Kelly Sones and Julia Minix from Danville for Division Six. The category of Power Structural and Technical Systems, Brian Harris, Conrad Weiser. We have the team of Braden Myers and Landon Neely from Big Spring. For Division 5, Haley Monroe from Conrad Weiser. And for Division 6, the team of Caleb Radel and Megan Peters from Greenwood. Moving on to our last category, Social Systems, individual Nevin Brophy from Greenwood. The team of Abigail Beidel and Zoe Kosher from Big Spring. And our last state champion for Division Five, Haley Blowers from Tyrone. Pennsylvania FFA, one more time, let's get a round of applause for all of our state champions in the Agri-Science Fair. 
Thank you. We all have dreams, but in order to make those dreams a reality, it takes a whole lot of hard work, dedication, self-discipline, and effort, which is exactly what our Agri Science Fair participants did. Congratulations, you guys have shown us what the phrase doing to learn of our FFA motto actually means. Let's give a huge round of applause to Mr. Surfaz, our, our committee chair, along with all the Agri Science Fair participants tonight. Yeah, you know what we is. Sometimes you gotta stay in, in. Welcome to my house. Baby, take control now. We can't even slow now. We don't have to go a while. Welcome to my house. Play the music too loud. Our next, our next guest hails from the great state of Oregon. And although he likes to travel a lot, being in New Mexico just a couple of days, catching a flight and flying up here to Pennsylvania, he's here to join us. And growing up, he was a little bit chatty, and he earned that nickname, Motor Mouth. But in high school, he said FFA was one place that he could truly be himself. And even though he didn't grow up on a farm, he's certainly no stranger to agriculture. And he loves trying new things. He went as far as making himself a personal rule of thumb to try a new career and leadership development event every single year. Pennsylvania FFA, let's welcome our national Western Region Vice President, Shea Booster. How are you doing, Pennsylvania FFA? Ah, nice. Owen, how we doing? Yeah, <laughs> good job, Owen. Hey, y'all, I'm really excited to be here in the great state of Pennsylvania. I've been through a couple of times, and my, ha my family's very history-oriented, so we did the whole Eastern Theater of the Civil War a few years ago, uh, but haven't been back since, so super excited to be here and spend the next few days uh, with you. But I'd like to share and talk about you know, the biggest annoyance in my life, and no, it's not Justin Kurtz, uh, nor is it my little sister. Uh, the biggest annoyance in my life is mild inconveniences. Now when I'm talking about mild inconveniences, I'm talking about when you step in a puddle of water and you're only wearing socks. Ooh, yeah, I could, I could feel the cringe. Have you ever stepped in a puddle of water only wearing socks, changed socks, then stepped in the same puddle? Yeah? All right, yeah, all the time? Dude, maybe clean the water up first. Another one that really bothers me, I'm very food motivated. So in the morning when I'm ready for cereal and I pour my favorite bowl of cereal and I swing open the refrigerator door and there's no milk. Yeah, that one's real. Have you ever had to funnel cereal from a bowl into a bag inside of a box? Yep. The only one that eats is my dog. Maybe my least favorite of all is when I'm sitting over here trying to binge watch my favorite show. And the TV controller's over there. But I'm over here. And it's over there. And I'm over here. And I'm not going to leave the sanctity of my couch just to change channels. But as long as you're touching the furniture, you're safe. So you've got two options. You can either do the Spider-Man, where you're like lunging for it. Or you can play hot lava and jump from furniture to furniture. Inconveniences like those, bane of my existence. I can't stand them. You know, people ask, hey, Shay, what would make a perfect world? I think of those things, because in a perfect world, there would be no inconveniences. Now, growing up, there was one inconvenience that plagued my life more than any, and that was the inconvenience of yard work, specifically edging my dad's grass. Now, for those of us who don't know what edging a lawn looks like, uh, you cut, clip, and trim the edges of the grass to keep it neat, orderly, and pretty. You know, there's no landscaping police that mandate that you edge your grass. You just do it so your neighbor doesn't trash your yard. And my dad wasn't going to let Merle trash talk his baby. So every year, my brother, my dad, and I would edge our grass. Now, fortunately for landscapers everywhere, they make high-quality lawnmowers and lawn edgers that will edge acres of grass in minutes. But unfortunately for my brother Connor and I, my dad didn't believe in the convenience of said technology. So instead, he armed us with old wood-framed 
rusted steak knives. Yeah, steak knives. The knives that were designed to cut, you know, American beef were now being used to saw into Mother Nature as if she was the toughest steak in the state of Oregon. An acre and a half of grass we hand cut every summer with knives. Why? Because it builds character. <laughs> this is the biggest hunk of junk I've ever heard. It builds character. Like, what are you talking about, Dad? No, but a decommissioned steak knife to my dad, the perfect tool for the job. And that job wasn't just making his lawn pretty. It was making my brother Connor and I into acceptable men. And to this day, my dad still credits our character to his version of that boot camp. You know, looking back on all those days, and I mean, it took days of edging that grass with my dad and my brother, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Not even a handheld gas-propelled lawn edger. I mean, back in the day, I would have taken one, but now, no, nah, it was worth it. Here's why. The hours that it took to edge and cut that grass by hand with knives was inconvenient. But it made it more convenient for me to build relationships with my dad and with my brother, which ultimately is more important to me than the time I would have spent outside goofing around with my buddies. You know, in fact, if you type in my home address into Google Earth, which I'm not going to give you because somebody would look me up and that's just weird, but if I gave you my home address and you typed it into Google Earth, from space you can see my dad's pride and joy outside. His lawn. Not my brother and I. His lawn. But... If you zoom in on his lawn, you can see three figures on all fours with steak knives and hands. Just so happened to be when Google took those pictures, it captured my dad, my brother, and I out there being inconvenienced. But we were out there together. So why is it that we view inconveniences as only bad things? When really, inconveniences can be the things that give us opportunities to grow, to become more, to do more. To make ourselves into better versions of who we are and who we want to be. All right, so if inconveniences aren't necessarily bad, does that mean that everything that's convenient and good for us? What's something I like? Let's go back to food, because I like food. I ate so much at dinner tonight. The best thing about all you can eat buffets is there's nobody telling you no more. Growing up, my dad taught me that my favorite thing to eat was whatever was in front of me, and my favorite flavor was more. So I was always going back for seconds. But there was one food item that Shay always wanted, Top Ramen. I loved ramen noodles, and I know there's not a whole lot to them, but I loved them. And my mom, Sally, being the, the health nut that she is, wouldn't let young Shay have them because, quote, it's too much sodium for your small body to handle, which is exactly what every 4'11", 90-pound freshman wants to hear from his mom. Uh, but she told me every time I asked for top ramen that it was just too much sodium. But what my mom couldn't stop is when you go to college, all you hear about is, how much Top Ramen college kids get to eat. So when I went to Oregon State last year, I decided to put my love of Top Ramen to the test. And at one point, I ate Top Ramen for 17 meals in a row. Yeah, that's gross. You can, you can gag. That's disgusting. 17 meals in a row. That's about five and a half days of only eating Top Ramen. And about halfway through that fifth day, I was, pun intended, feeling a little salty. Like, I just felt gross. Um, and so then I thought, you know what, maybe my mom wasn't wrong. Maybe she's a little bit smarter than she appears, so I, I decided to look into it and figure out how much sodium is in one pack of Top Ramen. About 40% of your daily sodium intake, one pack of Top Ramen. Most meals, I ate at least two. So in a five and a half day stretch, I consumed over a dozen days worth of sodium alone off noodles. Yeah, it's gross, but it was convenient. All right, what else? The snooze button. Yeah, let's hear it for the snooze button if you use it. Woo! I think that's sad that that's the loudest cheer we've had tonight. The snooze button. It's great, right? We can be asleep, just blissfully off dreaming. And then what happens? So what do we do? Boom, snooze button. Nine more minutes of bliss. Why it's nine minutes, I don't know. Ask Apple, but it is nine minutes. But nine minutes later, what happens? <laughs> Boom, snooze button. But nine minutes later, what happens? Yeah. So what do we do? Boom, snooze button. Nine minutes later, boom, snooze button. All of a sudden, we've hit the snooze button five times. How convenient was it that we started the day off with 45 minutes of procrastination? 
Yeah, and we all cheered for that. Yeah, procrastination. <laughs> no. All right, what else? Let's look at our phones, social media, our phones. It's amazing what we can do with a phone. In seconds, we can all pull out our phones and communicate with thousands of people all over the world. Take a, take a minute and look around the room. Y'all, the advisors, some of the advisors in here used to have to hand write a letter. All right, they would put it, uh, they would hand it to a man on a horse who would write it from here to Philadelphia. All right, then it would get on a train. It was a short train, but down to Boston. And then they'd hand that letter to a man on a boat. Three months later, it'd make it to Europe. Some of your advisors lived through that. We can do that in three seconds. But how often do we find ourselves using technology for the important and good uses of technology? How, how often do we find ourselves using it productively when really we're just mindlessly scrolling through Facebook watching random videos of, of squirrels and tutus on water skis? I know that's random. I know because there's like a 47 second video of it online. I watched it three times last night. Why? Because it's there. You know? And that's why we do it. Some do it because it's just easy. Some of us have nothing else to do. Others, unfortunately, wish to escape into the cyber world looking for those easy and quick validations because working for real relationships is just too hard. It's just too inconvenient. Whatever our reasoning is, the average person in the United States spends 135 minutes on their phone a day on social media. 135 minutes on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, I'm missing some, MySpace. I guess if you're on MySpace, it took 135 minutes to load, but either way, 135 minutes on social media alone. Hey, but that's just minutes, right? It can't be that bad. 135 minutes a day. Over the course of a year, that's 49,275 minutes. That's just minutes, right? 49,275. That's just under 34 days. So a month of every year we spend living through our phones. Hey, but luckily, in the U.S., you can expect to live to 80 years old. But if, for every year that you're alive, you spend one month on your phone, by the time you die way down here at 80 years old, you will have spent... You will have lost just under seven years of your life living through a piece of plastic and metal rather than through real words, real actions, and real relationships. Seven years. Take a moment and think. Does the type of convenience that your phone affords you, is it worth those seven years? If the answer happens to be no, put the phone down. Log out of your accounts every once in a while. Put the digital world on hold, because if you don't, the real world that's still spinning, she's going to pass you right by. When we are on our phones or watching the news or just listening to what's going on around us, have you ever noticed how negative we are as people? Have we ever? Why is everything so negatively charged, negatively fueled? Well, I'll let you in on a secret. It's easy. It's convenient. It's more convenient for ourselves to be negative towards the world, towards others, and towards ourselves. It's just easier that way. You know, we look at the bad in the world, we point it out and say, oh, that's bad. Done. By pointing it out, we've done our part, right? No. We should not be satisfied with the status quo or merely just acknowledging that there's bad happening around us. Recognizing that there's something wrong going on around us, but choosing not to do anything about it, that's convenient. Recognizing that there's too much poverty in our local communities, but instead of doing something ourselves to make a difference, we end up just hitting the like button on a video somebody else posted of them making a difference. As if our acknowledgement of their already done deed is supposed to ease our conscience or make us feel like we've made a difference. That's convenient, y'all. I can do that from my couch. I have done that from my couch. So it's time that we start 
inconveniencing ourselves so others can live more conveniently. So when you go home next weekend, give up some time you'd spend hanging out with your friends or playing Fortnite with the bros to, to visit a homeless shelter. Yeah, the Fortnite guys up there were like, yeah, do it. That's the only time I'm going to do that. That was horrible. Never again. Give up some time you'd spend playing Fortnite. You know, visit a homeless shelter. Go visit the elderly at a retirement home or help your neighbor out with some yard work. Granted, if that neighbor hands you a steak knife to cut their grass, just walk away. Just walk away. Or better yet, accept it and see the type of relationship that you're able to forge over the next few hours. Even better than that, recruit in some of your friends. Say, hey, Owen, let's go do it together. That's what we call a positive inconvenience. We have to choose to live our lives through positive inconveniences, not negative conveniences. A negative convenience is when we tear other people down because we just don't feel worthy. We just don't feel capable. We just don't feel like we're enough. Has anyone in the room been made, felt like, has been made to feel like that? Where someone has made you feel incapable, unworthy, just not good enough? Anyone? All right. It's dark. Can't really see. I'm imagining there's some hands in the room. It's not a good feeling. But now let's be honest with ourselves. How many times have we made somebody feel unworthy, incapable, or just not, that they're not good enough? Just me? I've been there. I can't tell you how many times I've done something like that to my mom. My mom is the most selfless person I've ever known. Let's hear it if you love your mom. Does anybody love their mom? Yeah. It's official. Moms beat procrastination. I love my mom, but I couldn't tell you how many times I've blatantly disregarded what she asked me to do simply because, you know, it wasn't convenient for me, or how many times I've done the opposite of what she asked simply because what she wanted was just a little too inconvenient. But it's time we start living our lives a little bit more inconveniently so our moms can live more conveniently. My mom is the only reason I'm here today. I was telling Justin earlier, my mom made me run for chapter office. My mom made me run for state office. When I didn't get national office the first year, it was my little sister and my mom that told me if I stopped now, I was giving up on everything. But my mom knew me getting national office would mean I'd be gone for an entire year. I think I've seen my mom three or four times since October. But she wanted that for me because she knew that the inconvenience it caused her made my life more convenient and that I was enjoying what I would do. How many of us would sacrifice the time with our best friend or someone that we love just so they can do what they wanted? It's not convenient for us. Go my mom. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Another negative convenience that we fall victim to is us not putting ourselves out there because we're just afraid that we're not going to be good enough. We're afraid that someone's going to tell us that we're not good enough. So we, we don't let ourselves try. The days of just looking in a mirror and saying, I want different and different happening are done. You have to chase that difference. We can't look in a mirror anymore and say, you know what? I want to be taller. I want to be bigger. I want to be stronger. I want to be you know, skinnier. I want to have more friends. I want to play on the basketball team. I want to be smarter. I want to sing in the choir, play in the band. I want to display my art for the world to see. But you know, I won't let myself. I won't let myself because I am too convenienced by the safety that I feel within the box of my own creation. We put ourselves in that box. We're the only ones that can get us out. So it's time to pick that box up, dismantle it, rip it apart, and unshackle ourselves from the convenience that prohibits our growth. If we can do that, we'll grow. I promise we'll grow. Now, I don't claim to be a great philosopher. I don't know many things for sure. Uh, but I do know that there is no growth in the convenient zone, and there is no convenience in the growth zone. We can either choose to be convenienced or we can choose to grow, but they do not run in tandem. So what will your choice be? Live conveniently and eh, maybe grow, or live inconveniently and grow a whole heck of a lot. We're the only ones that get to make that choice. I know what I'm choosing. 
That's no question about it. Mild inconveniences, like stepping in puddles of water when you're only wearing socks, horrible. Horrible. If I step in one more puddle of water, I'm going to lose my mind. Not because, you know, it's the end of the world, but because I live out of a suitcase and I'm running out of socks. I can only do it so many more times. I was in Texas last week and I was talking about this. The next morning, an FFA chapter came with two pairs of socks and said, just in case you step in water. How cool is that? Going out of their way. We were in San Angelo, Texas. There's not a whole lot out there. I don't know how far they drove, but they went to find me socks. So what can you do to inconvenience yourself so those around you can live in a more convenient manner? By nature, humans, we're creatures of convenience. We will always seek the path of least resistance. But that path is also the path that allows us to grow the least. So ch take the path less traveled. Inconvenience yourself so your mom can live a little bit better, so your dad can live a little bit better, so your advisor can have a little bit easier of a time. What can you do today? What can you do tomorrow? What can you do every day that follows to live your life a little bit more inconveniently so those around you can live more conveniently? We may be creatures of inconvenience by nature, or creatures of convenience by nature, but I challenge you to be a creature of inconvenience. Thank you for having me here today. Go out throughout the rest of the convention. Go back to your home chapters. Make positive change, but do so in an inconvenient way so others can live better. Thanks for having me, y'all. Thanks, Daddy. Thank you. An incredible part about FFA is that we are a student-run organization, and luckily for all of us, their student leaders are some of the best. Pennsylvania FFA, let's make sure they hear us the whole way in Oregon as we thank our Western Region National Vice President, Shea Booster. FFA members, why are we here? We begin to answer with, to practice brotherhood. But why my teammates and I are here are to serve the nearly 13,000 members across the state of Pennsylvania. We have truly been humbled by the experiences and memories that we have gained this year. From our very first chapter visit at Elizabethtown, to playing bubble soccer with Philadelphia, and even chartering four new chapters at Midwinter Convention, this year will make saying goodbye so hard. We truly appreciate all the great times that we've made together. Let's take a look at all the great times we made together in our year in review video.
memories we didn't realize we were making memories we just knew we were having fun this past year has been an unlimited journey and the best things in life are the people that we meet the places we go and the memories we make together it's been an unlimited journey and we can't help but thank you guys enough for allowing my teammates and myself to be a part of it Over the past year, I have been absolutely blessed to have amazing memories with my six teammates and almost 13,000 of my new best friends. <laughs> yeah. However, as the year comes to a close, it is time for a new state officer team to make awesome memories with all of you outstanding Pennsylvania FFA members.
In order to run for state office, you must first be a high school graduate, have earned your state Keystone degree, and submit an application. These 20 individuals are now currently undergoing a, an intensive interview process, and we wish them the best of luck. So without further ado, let's meet our state officer candidates. What's up, Pennsylvania FFA? My name is Brandon Bixler, and I'm proudly representing the Grassland FFA chapter. Hey there, PA FFA. My name is Thomas Strawn, and I hail from the Greenwood FFA chapter. Good evening, P Pennsylvania FFA. My name's Killian George, and I proudly hail from the Cumberland Valley FFA chapter. Hello, Pennsylvania FFA. My name is Corey Lashford, and I am blessed to hail from the Big Spring FFA chapter. Hey, everyone. My name is Mackenzie Glass, and I'm from the Myersdale FFA chapter. Hello everyone, my name is Ryan McGuire and I hail from the Upper Dolphin Area FFA chapter! Hey PA FFA, my name is Mary Secord and I'm here to proudly represent the Gifford Pincho FFA chapter. Hey PA FFA, my name is Erlen Tegmar Oatman and I proudly represent the Manor FFA chapter. Hey Pennsylvania FFA, my name is Michael Riggs and I proudly represent the Battlefield FFA chapter. Hey there PA FFA, my name is Christina Tedesco and I'm oh so proudly from the Athens FFA chapter. Hey there PA FFA, my name is Morgan Cheney and I'm proudly representing the Little Dutchman FFA. Hi everyone, my name is Timber Tebus and I proudly hail from the West Perry FFA chapter. Good evening, Pennsylvania FFA. My name is Brindle Kemmler and I proudly hail from the Central Columbia FFA chapter. Woo! How's it going, PA FFA? My name is Andrew Hobgood and I am honored to represent the Trinity FFA chapter. What is up, Pennsylvania FFA? My name is Robert Kistner, and I'm proudly representing the Athens FFA chapter. Hey, Pennsylvania FFA. My name is Ben Miskin from the Cumberland Valley FFA chapter. Hello, Pennsylvania FFA. I am Erica Miller, and I am here proudly representing Trinity FFA. Hello, Pennsylvania FFA. My name is Josh Conklin. I'm proudly representing the Trinity FFA. Hey there, PF, PA FFA. My name is Sean Hill. Can I proudly represent the Dairy FFA chapter? Yeah! Hey, everybody. I'm Trent Maley, and I'm from Wilmington area. Running for a state officer position is a huge commitment, and this group's willingness to serve is outstanding. Let's hear it one more time for our 2019-2020 state officer candidates. Madam Secretary, do you have a record of any further business that should now be transacted? I have none, Madam President. Does any member know of any new or unfinished business that should properly come before this session? We are about to join this, the first session of the 90th Pennsylvania FFA State Convention and Activities Week. As we mingle with others, let us be diligent in labor, just in our dealings, courteous to everyone, and above all, honest and fair in the game of life. Fellow members and guests, please join me in a salute to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The 
the chaplain will lead us in a closing reflection. May we assume an attitude of reflection in which we are each most comfortable. We pray that thou be with us as we go forth from this session, and may we, may we dedicate our lives to the service of our fellow men and to the fulfillment of thy holy will. Amen. I now declare this session adjourned. Woo!